This will be the conclusion of our series we've been doing, looking at the activity or the timeline from when Jesus gave up the ghost, died on the cross, paid for our sins, said it was finished. And then the activity or the timeline that was happening between that and when he rose from the dead. So now we are going to go from paradise to resurrection. We have a resurrected Lord. Look at Psalm chapter 16. Let's start reading in verse number eight. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I already preached on that uh, earlier message. Verse 11, thou wilt show me the path of life, In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And verse number 11, the path of life. This life, people take those two ways. There's the way of life. And then there's the way that seemeth right. (laughs) There really are just two ways. It's not like you walk into the ice cream store and there's 50 selections. This life really is down to two selections. It's the way of life or it's the way that seemeth right. And because people go the way that seemeth right, that's why we got to get the gospel to. Jesus said he is the way definite article. That's it. He said, follow me. He said in Proverbs three, six and all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Why do we have to go out and give people directions? Why do we need to bring the GPS, God's plan of salvation? Why do we need to give people directions? Because they are not allowing the Lord to direct their way. We've got to show them the Lord's way. So they can get on board and get in the right path, in the right way. When people go the way that seemeth right, that way, by it's, a, it's humanistic thinking. Because whatever way they decide, that is their final authority. In other words, they become their final authority. And that's a dangerous spot to be in. And, that, and it's just not what it seems. The way that seemeth right, young people especially, It's the popular way. It's the way that most young people will go. Most people will go. But it doesn't end well. Jesus' way, he said, follow me, it ends well. Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto men, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So Psalm 16, we we saw, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Let's go over to Acts chapter number 2. Verse number 24. Our cross reference here. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Psalm 16, 
was the prophecy. David, in Acts chapter 2, we see the prophecy verified. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It was prophesied by David, and it happened just like the old time prophets said it would. Jesus never lies. His Bible is always true. Jesus himself promised it. Let's go over to Matthew chapter number 16. Back to Matthew chapter 16, that is. Matthew chapter 16. Verse number 21. The Bible says from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Jesus promised it would happen and it did. We also have in Matthew 12. Uh, verse number 40, go back there. Matthew 12, verse number 40, the Bible says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We preached on that verse as we were going through this series. We're not going to teach on it tonight, but we are going to use it as a way of remembrance that here's the sign or the foreview given by Jonas that Jesus will Rise from the dead. Three days and three nights. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go over there. But keep your finger in Matthew. Here's, here's a foreview. A foreview of the resurrected Savior. By faith, verse 17, Hebrews 11. When he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Just a four of you, just a four of you. Matthew 27. The resurrection is what makes our gospel glorious. It, what, it, it is what makes our news good. Think about it. We want to go out and bring the gospel. That is the good news, right? We tell people they're a sinner. Well, that's not good news. <laughs> we tell people they're on their way to hell. That ain't good news. <laughs> then we go on to tell them, don't worry. You deserve it. There would be nothing wrong with God doing that. Well, that's not good news. <laughs> I'm telling you. Unless you give them the whole story, the good news ain't going to make sense to them. Yes, Jesus died for their sins. Yes, he was buried. Yes, that was prophesied. Yes, it was for your sins. But how does that help me again? It doesn't unless he rises from the dead and defeats death and is a living advocate standing alive at the right hand of God and wanting and, and able and willing to save whosoever will. But without him being alive forevermore, all we have is another dead little G God fairy tale. That's not what we got. We got the real thing. We got the goods. Matthew 27 Okay. If, there, if there's ever a passage of scripture where you want more information, this would be one of them. We'll read what we have and we'll try not to read too much into it. Jesus, Matthew 27, verse 50. When he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints 
which slept arose. Now, I'm not going to read verse 53 yet. I just want to kind of think on this a little bit. What all happened here? <laughs> did, did the graves open? And the spirits of those from those bodies come down, and and those and and those folks just did, did they awake and like didn't get out yet? Like, what? Well, how did all this happen? When Jesus died on the cross, and that veil was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, the earth is quaking, the rocks are renting, and the graves. <laughs> are opening. What if you were in the graveyard visiting grandma? Too bad there weren't any GoPros back then. That would have been that would have been freaky. <laughs> but you've got graves opening, and watch what it says. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose. I mean, did they arise like when the rocks are running and the It's pretty interesting to just park at that comma after verse 52. Now, however it all worked out, I know this. Graves were open. Many bodies of the saints which slept the rose. Now, watch verse 53. Here it is. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. Did they stay in the graves awake when the graves were open? Like if they. Here's what we know what happened after the resurrection. They came out of the graves and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Step back a bit, take another thought. Look at verse number 53 where it says, And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. It's pretty obvious where these bodies are, right? Duh, the grave. Where are their souls? I believe they're in paradise. They're in paradise. And verse number 53, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared unto many. It's this is the trip. I believe this is the trip from paradise from that for those souls to now be re-entered into their bodies. And you didn't have like decaying people walking around with their arm falling off because that's not what a resurrection is. Yeah. It's the conquering of death. It's the conquering of disease. It is the victory. And that's exactly what happened. The resurrection is the conquering of it all. And we see that with Jesus coming up out of paradise, conquering all that. Verse 53, it's also the first fruits. We've preached on that earlier. It's the first fruits. God's harvest. Remember we talked about that? First fruits, main harvest, gleanings. This is the first fruits of the first resurrection. So that's Matthew 27. Let's go to Psalm 68, if you would, and let's get Ephesians 4. Get Psalm 68 in one hand and Ephesians 4 in the other. Let's try to get some understanding out of this. All right, Psalm 68. Get quick thinking caps on now. Just try to stay with me. I'm not going to try to go too quick. Psalm 68, verse 18. The Bible says, Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. That's Psalm 68. Now let's get Ephesians chapter 4. Psalm 68. Now we'll go to Ephesians chapter 4. Who's Psalm 68 talking about? Well, Ephesians 4 will tell us. Verse number 6. 
one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, who's that? Christ. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? What do we have in Psalm 68? The prophecy. What do we have in Ephesians chapter 4? The fulfillment of that prophecy and the confirmation that that's what Jesus said. Ephesians chapter four. Now look at Psalm 68. If you go back there. We have some common denominators. Between that and Ephesians four. Ascended on high. That's both there in Ephesians four and Psalm 68. Led captivity captive. Both of those are there. Received or gave gifts unto men. Both of those are there in our reference in our Psalm 68 and our Ephesians 4. What's not there? There's one thing in Psalm 68 that's not in Ephesians 4. I'll give you a second to look at it. It'll jump right out at you. And if it doesn't, when I give it to you, it, you'll see it. For the rebellious also. See that at the end of Psalm 68, 18, it says, Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Now, in Psalm 68, who's this speaking of? Well, rebellious Israel. By the time you get to Ephesians 4, why is it omitted in Ephesians? Well, Israel and the church are not the same. It goes on to talk about the gifts unto the church. Okay, so that's something to note in your cross-reference of Psalm 68 and then your Ephesians 4. We're going to come back to that thought in a minute, but look at verse number 9 in Ephesians 4. Verse number 9, what happens first? Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? What did he do first? He descended, right? Everybody can see that. Where are the lower parts of the earth? Remember, it was the first lesson when we started. Third heaven, second heaven, first heaven, earth, under the earth where the sea is and all the fish life. And what's in the heart of the earth? Hell and paradise, right? So where did he go first? Part of the earth, lower parts of the earth. What's there? Hell, the spirits of hell, the rich man in hell. Paradise, Abraham and all those in Abraham's bosom, the malefactor that he had the appointment with, that we already preached on, the great gulf, which is no problem because he can walk on water. He went right there. And now he's in paradise. And guess what? He already ascended or descended. He did that first. Now he's going to ascend. And then what happened? What we read in Matthew uh, 27 occurs. All right, everybody see, see that part. Now, let's go back to this rebellious part again. Or the rebellious also. And let me give you some thoughts on that. Look at Ephesians 4. Let's see how this can apply to us. Uh, verse 10 of Ephesians 4. We're already there. Um, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That would be born again believers for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ would be the saints. It would be us. It would be believers. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, and but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things 
which is the head, even Christ, one more verse, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Woo! That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful that's chock full of goodness right there. Do you know why God gave you the spiritual gift or gifts that you have? To edify the saints. For the work of the ministry. So that we can all be better for it and be going into the fullness of of what it's like to be like Christ. This is why we get together around God's word. This is why we get together and go out with evangelism. This is why we get together for group prayer. This is why we fellowship and do what we do. It's for the perfecting. I can't be perfected without you. You can't be perfected without y'all. We need each other. And when your toe hurts, you don't cut it off and throw it away. When your toe hurts, your hand takes care of it and puts some salve on it. Another part of the body helps another part of the body, but it's one body. And too many times Christians are in the amputee business. <laughs> Look, I'm not talking about church discipline right now. I'm talking about unity and I'm talking about. If you don't see the whole paradise being moved and all these events that happening between the death of Christ and his resurrection exactly the same way that I see them. Do we really need to split over that? No, we don't. Now I start changing the Bible. I start having a different way of salvation. I start doubting the Trinity. I start backtracking on evangelism I start bringing in false doctrine. Okay, now we got a problem. Now we're in the amputee business. Look, brother. <laughs> because we just don't run wild with our imagination yeah. with a way that seemeth right. Mm -hmm. That's why we're in the Bible. So everybody can read the Bible. And what does it say in Ephesians 4? Who's the head? It's not the Baptist Pope. It's not the Bap. It's Jesus Christ. Yeah. If we would just get wrapped around the truth of his word, we would just save ourselves a lot of fussing and get ourselves a lot of unity. You find a good Bible believing preaching church that isn't going to correct the book. And it's got a lot of other major, major things, right? The passage in Isaiah or Ezekiel or Amos or Revelation or Chronicles that somebody disagrees on or sees it a different way. Can't we just fight about it over lunch and then go out and witness to somebody? Yeah. Uh, really? Really? That's what we want. That's the spirit that we want to inculcate at our small little church. And God, let's try to give God something to work with. Okay. <laughs> Not that he needs our help, but you, uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's not go out of our way to just be rebellious. Now, to, to, fi to figure out what, the, what, the, what this rebellious, look at this for a second. Maybe this will give us some insight into for the rebellious also that we saw in Psalm 68. When we continue reading in verse 17, watch what it says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. That you henceforth walk, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. That's a rebellious walk. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, the rebellious. 
because of the blindness of their heart or just rebellions. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness. That's a rebellious lifestyle. To work all uncleanness with greediness. All of those are the character traits of a rebel. How do we deal with the rebellions? Did God give us gifts? Mm-hmm. Are we supposed to use those gifts to the perfecting of the ministry and the edifying of the saints? We are. And as we become more united and as we become stronger as a local body, we are able to use those gifts to affect the rebellious and bring them to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. So that he directs their path. They're not going on their own direction. Come on. <clears throat> I don't believe there's any contradictions in the Bible at all. And if we see something we don't understand, we don't need to correct the Bible. We need to pray and wait. So get John 20 and Matthew 28. Psalm of John, John 20. People see passages like this and they just kind of lose it. And they got to write something on their blog that says, well, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, there's just a contradiction in your misfiring in your brain on how to think. (laughs) There's no contradictions in the Bible. People that find contradictions in the Bible should do a better job at finding out how their life contradicts the Bible. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And they'll be better off just doing it that way. John chapter 20, verse number 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. You see that in verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. Now let's get over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, look at verse number nine. Matthew 28, verse nine. And when they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren. They go into Galilee and there shall they see me. So what is it? Touch me not or go ahead and touch my feet. Is there a contradiction in the Bible or not? There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. Did we just read that he led captivity captive? Who's got him captured? The Lord. He's in paradise. He kept his appointment with the thief on the cross. And he's going to lead captivity captive. Right? We already read that. He's going to bring those souls out of paradise. Those souls are going to meet the graves that were open in the bodies. And then guess what's going to happen? He's going to take them out of this world. And guess where they're going to go? They're going to ascend up on high. So there's no contradiction in the Bible. All Jesus did is he went from paradise, descended first in lower parts of the earth. He ascends. He comes up to the earth. Those souls reunite with the body. There's a little street meeting, if you will, (laughs) that didn't last too long at all. And guess where they go? They go right up to the third heaven. Every single one of them, paradise, the whole bit of its move. And then guess what happens? He comes back down to the earth 
and says, okay, now you can touch me. Go ahead, touch my feet. Yeah, it's me. Go ahead, Thomas. There's no contradiction in the Bible. Jesus led captivity captive, makes a short stop on the earth, ascends to the Father. All paradise, all those saints now, everything's been done from the death of the cross to the shed blood to the rising of the dead to the resurrecting, all that, and boom, everybody before the cross that was asleep in Abraham's bosom, gone. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, when the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Jesus defeated death, right? He did. Was it a problem for him to pass through hell? No. He didn't stay there long, grab the keys. When he, when he was passing by, did a little bit of preaching, gets the, goes through the gulf. That didn't stop him. He can walk right on water. He leads captivity captive. Look, this resurrection idea, like we said earlier, it's not dead bodies walking around like it's some bad decay thing. It's a conquering of. It's so glorious that we have a hard time getting a mind picture of it when we read verses like Matthew 27, John 20, when we read those verses. This in a moment, in a twinkling of, I mean, everybody twinkling your eyes. It's fast. That fast. Do you think these two verses of John 20 and Matthew 28, there's not a lot, a lot of time passing. This is all happening in one day that he can go from paradise to earth. Don't touch me. I've not yet ascended. And in a twinkling of an eye, be up and back down. Nothing else was a problem for him. So no contradiction there when we look at John 20. And Matthew chapter number 28. All right. So that will end our lesson in this series. It takes us from paradise to the resurrected Savior. He leads captivity captive. And everything, everything that we preach to the lost. The whole thing ties. It's the loose ends are all tied up. And the package of the good news is so glorious because we have a living, resurrected Savior.